What I what today again, I'll just introduce Leonard Marses, who is going to be presenting a topic that is, of course, very important for all of us here, and that is how I'm going to read. Uh, it's a uh, it's basically how not to die in the desert is how I like to say it. Um, but the the real title is a dozen ways to die in the desert, and of course, with our uh, extreme heat and real desert landscaping. Uh, they're, they're posed many different ways that are dangerous for us as we're outside. So this should be a very fascinating um, presentation. But before that, I just want to share a little bit about Leonard. And that is, uh, Leonard is a past board member of the Arizona Historical Society, which is a, a state um, of Arizona trustee agency that oversees several museums um, and historic properties across the state. He um, has, has sat on the board actually multiple times. Most recently, he was reappointed by Governor Ducey in 2018. Uh, he's also um, been part of the Historic Preservation Commission for the city of Scottsdale. He served on the board of directors of the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy and is a former chairman of the board. And he has written many different articles that have appeared in different uh, periodicals about the McDowell Mountains and its history. Um, in addition to that, there are, I'm, Leonard, if there's something else afterwards that you want to share that I'm skipping, please do um, and share it as well. But he has also been an occasional script writer for, uh, and narr narrator for the city of Scottsdale's cable TV channel. So if you live in Scottsdale, cable TV channel 11, uh, the historical series Scottsdale Yesterdays, uh, he's written for some of that. And as well, he's a Marine veteran, so thank you for your service. And he lives in Scottsdale currently with his wife, Lindy, and he is the parent of three boys, Jacob, Joshua, and Drew. So again, thank you very much for your time today and your presentation. We're looking forward to it. Thank you. Uh, I would like to take a minute uh, to thank everyone um, for the opportunity to speak, but in particular, I'd like to thank uh, Rabbi Levitov uh, because these kinds of presentations don't happen by accident. They happen because there's a lot of hard work behind the scenes to set up the schedules, to set up the, the technology, excuse me, the technology that allows us to speak uh, with each other. Uh, and so I would be remiss if I didn't say thank you to Rabbi Levertov for all the work that I know he and I assume his family have done behind the scenes. Uh, with that, um, are we ready to ready to go? Yeah, we're ready to go. So okay, so I'll hit the easel down here. Well, first, actually, you have to share your screen again. So I, I because Oops. I stopped that. So just go back to the Zoom first, and then you'll do that. Perfect. And then we'll go to the easel. Yep. You good? Perfect. Excellent. This uh, is called uh, A Dozen Ways to Die in the Desert. Uh, it's a grim topic, but uh, we hope that you find it somewhat entertaining today. Um, we are going to, if we do our job properly, uh, give you some entertainment, but also give you some information that could prove useful uh, in either saving your life or keeping you from ending up like some of the individuals in these two photographs. With that, we need to do a disclaimer. And the interesting thing about this disclaimer is that it was written several years ago, but in reviewing it just a couple of days ago, it struck me how it pertains to what we are all going through today with the COVID pandemic. So here's the disclaimer. All human activity involves risk. And boy, do we know that today. Getting in your car and going down to uh, the local Fry's or Albertsons is now an adventure. Um, if you want to minimize risk, stay in bed. Our activities are good for the body and soul. I think we all know that. Uh, and particularly these days, uh, sunlight does have uh, a salutary effect uh, on the coronavirus. 
So being out of doors, being in the sun, as long as you're not out there in 114 degrees, uh, is really good for your body and good for your soul. However, outdoor activities occasionally involve risk, both external, stuff that nature does to us, and self-inflicted, things we do to ourselves. The purpose of this presentation is to build risk awareness while encouraging enjoyable outdoor experiences. I hope we, you take that away. The recommendations, suggestions, and opinions expressed during this presentation are those of the presenter and do not necessarily represent positions or policies of Rabbi Lever. So the rabbi is off the hook with the attorneys. I'm on the hook. Remember one thing. If you remember nothing else from this presentation, remember that when you go out into the desert, you are responsible for yourself else is responsible for you. You are responsible for yourself. It's just like when you go out uh, to the shopping uh, center or out for groceries these days, you are responsible for your own protection. So let's go. The first thing we have is a panic. It's a mountain lion. Can see who knows what this really is because people are looking at the, some of you and saying that's not a mountain lion you're right but as a public service to you and a public service to the arizona game and fish department az uh, gfd the the fish and game department and local law enforcement get more calls about this animal which is bobcat then uh, they need to get because people will look at this animal in their backyard or in their condo development. They'll see it. They know it's not a nice little neighborhood kitty. Uh, it looks kind of wild, so it must be a mountain lion. It's a bobcat. And today we're going to teach you how to instantly, instantly tell the difference when you meet with one of these. It's very simple. Bobcats have spots. You can see the spots. And they have a very short tail. That's how they get their name. It's a bobbed tail. It's a bobcat. Spots, short tail. That's all you have to remember. If you can remember that, you will never misreport this. You will never go into a panic when you see these, these animals uh, around your home or your condo. That's a mountain lion. Okay. Uh, a bobcat generally is considered to be pretty good sized when they hit about 20 pounds. That mountain lion, if it's a female, will be somewhere in the neighborhood of 120 to 130 pounds. And if it's a male, uh, it's going to be 150 to 170. Notice, no spots, it's completely kind of a tan fur, long tail. So if you see a cat and it looks sort of big and it doesn't have spots and it has a long tail, you are now confronting a major predator. I know what you're thinking. Couldn't happen in my neighborhood. Hang on. Everybody now can see the difference between a bobcat, right? Spots and short tail and a mountain lion. In case you don't think you're going to meet one in your neighborhood, how about this one in Gilbert and the suburbs? Or isn't this a cute one? This is a Little one curious in somebody's back patio looking through their sliding glass door. In Peoria, Arizona. But if you want to get closer to home, how about these three? This is a female with two cubs. In the middle of the Desert Mountain Golf Course in Scottsdale. Why not? It's got grass, it's cool, it's got water. There are probably bunny rabbits around to eat. You can meet a mountain lion at any time, anywhere, and I speak from experience. I've spent a lot of years in the back country of Arizona, and I've only had one mountain lion encounter, and that was so far away that I had no cause for concern. About 10 years ago, my wife walked out the front door of our house here in Scottsdale in a regular neighborhood, walked over a footbridge, looked down in the wash, and there was a female mountain lion about 45 feet away from her. So 
Is it likely that you'll see a mountain lion? No, but if you do uh, and you meet one, you need to know what to do. So, oh, look at this one, middle of the night in the middle of the McDowell Mountains at a water catchment. Mountain lion attacks are rare, but they do occur. Um, well, there was one in June 2010 uh, in the snowdrift mine area in Kingman where someone was bitten on a leg, scratched on the shoulder, and the mountain lion ran off. Um, the most recent tragic situation was in April of 2000. There was a four-year-old girl who was camping with her family at Bart Bartlett Lake. And as often happens with families that are camping, mom was preparing the evening meal. It was towards sunset. Uh, dad was doing something to get the camp ready. And this little girl needed to, some entertainment. And so what she did was she noticed that there were moths on the side of their camping tent. And she took a, a dish rag and began to flip the moths off the side of the tent. Well, do you, do you know what this is to a bobcat? This looks exactly like a white-tailed deer's tail going up uh, in, uh, in terror. And so it triggers the attack impulse. And this cat attacked this young girl. The family actually beat the cat with their fists. Uh, and it took considerable time to uh, get this cat off. Uh, and unfortunately, this, this girl suffered uh, very deep uh, wounds. Um, here's what you need to do if you encounter one of these, and you may uh, in, uh, in, a, in a developed area. The first is the hardest thing to do. Keep calm. Good luck. Every instinct in your body will say, I need to turn around and run. Perfectly normal instinct and your adrenaline is going to go sky high. You must remain calm. The second thing is, again, this is counterintuitive, face the cat. Never give your back, never give the back of your neck, because that is its prime attack process. It goes for uh, the neck. Um, so you want to face the cat. Now, some of you have probably learned that when you're confronted with a bear, uh, you should not stare at the bear uh, and cause it to be upset. That's good for bears. You have to do exactly the opposite with a mountain. You must make eye contact with the cat. Because unlike bears that know they're stronger than you are, cats, mountain lions, are attackers and killers of convenience. They understand in that, that little brain that if they get a broken leg, if, if they attack you, uh, they're going to die because they won't be able to sustain themselves. So what you want to do is you want to make that cat understand that you are the toughest person in the neighborhood. So you're going to make eye contact with it so it knows that you know that it's there. You don't advance because you don't want to trigger an attack by getting into its space way slowly, don't run because you'll look like prey, make yourself as large and loud as you possibly can, scream, yell, if you've got a coat or a jacket on, lift it up over your head. If some of you have cats, you may have had the situation where your, your, your home kitty is, is tearing up your furniture. And you walk over and you tower over that kitty. And you probably have seen the reaction where the cat's head looks up and the cat gets uncomfortable. Cats don't like to have to look up at something because that's intimidating. And that's what you want to do with this cat. You want to make yourself as large and loud as possible. Uh, if you have things at hand that you can throw, you want to throw them. But you don't want to advance on the cat. The message you want to take through that cat and deliver to that cat is, look, I know you're here, you know I'm here, but I'm not easy pickings. If you decide to attack me, I will hurt you. I'm tough. Yeah, we'll typically back off. Uh, and that will allow you and the cat to leave the area with a certain amount of dignity. 
If the cat reaches you, uh, you have to fight back. Uh, again, unlike bears where the uh, information is try to play dead, you don't want to do that with a cat because the only reason the cat will attack you is because it's looking at you as a male. So the only vulnerable parts on a cat are uh, basically its legs or if you can injure its eyes or injure its legs, um, it will probably go away. Uh, you also want to yell. You know what the best thing is to yell? Fire. Yell fire as loud as you can. Because if you yell help in a lot of urban areas, people don't want to get involved. But if you yell fire, guess what? Everybody wants to know where it is. Uh, and that's good advice anytime you're in an emergency. Uh, if somebody accosts you, uh, don't yell help, yell fire. That'll get a reaction. Uh, you'll know you're in mountain lion country if you run across a track with four toes. And if you look at that pad that looks sort of like uh, the palm of your hand, you will see that there are two little knobs on the forward edge, on the upper edge of that pad. Uh, your doggy doesn't have that on his or her track. Uh, only cats have that track with the two uh, nodes at the, at the top of the pad. So if you happen to see that, you know you're in cat country. And not that we all go out looking for poop, but some of us do. We, we are scatologists. Uh, that's what it looks like. It's usually, uh, as it ages, rather large. You can see the boot print next to it and turns white with age. Gila monsters, uh, rarely seen, cute little creatures. Um, however, oh, there's, a, there's one with a full tail. Beautiful beaded lizard type of, of animal. Uh, back in 1899, a doctor by the name of Ward, who was an old practitioner in the Valley said, I have never been called to attend a case of Gila monster bite and I don't want to be. I think a man who is fool enough to get bitten by a Gila monster ought to die. The creature is so sluggish and slow of movement that the victim of its bite is compelled to help largely in order to get bitten. This is true. Uh, they're very shy creatures, but if somebody picks them up, one of your grandchildren, uh, you, when you find one in your lot, they will bite and they have locking jaws. Now, what sort of person would allow himself to be bitten by a Gila monster? How about this distinguished doctor, Dr. George Goodfellow? Uh, he lived in Tucson for many years. He was the doctor who patched up the Earp brothers who were shot up at the shootout at the OK Corral. Uh, but he liked to experiment. And so he would pay people $5 for Gila monster specimens. And one day in 1891, he provoked one of those lizards purposely to bite him on the finger. He became ill and spent the next five days in bed, but he completely recovered. Uh, and he was able to send a letter to the Scientific American uh, when they had uh, exaggerated the deathly nature of the Gila monster uh, and told them that he had been bitten, knew the firsthand experience, uh, and they were nasty, but not deadly. If you are bitten, you see those teeth down at the bottom. If you're used to rattlesnakes, rattlesnakes have hollow fangs and they, they act as a syringe to inject the poison. Gila monster does its damage differently. You see the grooves in, in those teeth. What it does is it basically salivates. Those teeth lock into your flesh. The saliva gets into the, the wounds that the teeth have caused. And that's what causes uh, the infection um, and some of the neural damage from a Gila monster bite. So what do you do if you're bitten? Uh, you go to an emergency medical facility. They're not gonna have any trouble figuring out what happened because that Gila monster is still gonna be hanging onto your hand unless you do something to yank it off. So you go to an emergency medical facility and you use an assumed name because you don't want to be one of those fools that allowed a Gila monster to bite you. Everybody's favorite, rattlesnakes, right? 
I don't know how many of you have encountered them, but they're all around us. Uh, and so we're going to answer uh, some questions for you today. How deadly is a rattlesnake? There's a lot of baloney out there. Uh, what you're going to get today in the next minute or two uh, is the facts. No fake news here. The answer is there are several factors in a rattlesnake incident that determine whether it's going to be a relatively benign experience or whether it's going to be potentially a fatal experience. So here are the factors that have to be considered. The age of the snake. The younger and smaller the snake, the deadlier it is. Really? Yes. And here's why. As rattlesnakes age, they learn in that little rattlesnake brain that whenever they envenomate something, they have to borrow protein from their bodies to regenerate venom. And so older rattlesnakes er, learn not to inject everything on the first bite. And sometimes they don't inject anything. Sometimes the rat rattlesnake bite, the initial bite, is a dry bite. Young snakes haven't learned that lesson yet. And so when they, when they bite, uh, you get the full dose. There's also the elapsed time since the rattlesnake last envenomated something. If you run across a rattlesnake that has bitten you, but uh, a half an hour before it envenomated a mouse or a rat and ate it, uh, much of its venom is going to have been used and you can be fortunate. If you encounter a rattlesnake that hasn't had anything to eat for a week or two, uh, it's going to be loaded with venom and that could be a problem. There's also, as we said, whether or not it wants to bother with envenomation. Uh, older rattlesnakes uh, will often uh, bite without envenomation. The age and general health of the victim. An envenomation of a six foot tall, 200 pound human uh, is going to have less effect than envenomation on a four foot 11 inch, 95 pound human. Similarly, those of us who are older are going to uh, take or incur a lot more damage than someone who's younger and more resilient. The location of the bite. If the bite is on an extremity like a finger uh, or a toe or an ankle, uh, it's serious, but it's less serious than a bite to, say, a scalp or a shoulder. The distance and travel time to medical treatment. Uh, how long will it take to get the person who has been to a medical facility? What do you do if this happens? First thing you do is keep the victim calm. Hard to do, but very important. And if the bite's on an extremity, what you want to do is loosen or remove all constricting items, uh, such as jewelry, watch bands, tight clothing. No, you don't want to suck the wound and spit the blood and the venom out. That's not a good idea, either for you or for the person who's And no, you don't want to put a uh, restriction of any type on that limb unless you're a medical professional. Just get them to medical care as soon as you possibly can. How deadly are rattlesnakes? Uh, there are approximately 8,000 snake bites annually. Uh, on average, 12 are fatal. Uh, in Arizona, there are 13 species of rattlesnakes. And March through May is the peak season for bite incidents because they're just out of their dens and they're hungry and they're rather cross. Uh, in the period between 1990 and 2003, there was one fatal rattlesnake bite in Arizona. There's a way to die in the desert. During the same period, there were 17 lightning fat uh, fatalities. So if you like to go back out, in out into your backyard or on the front patio and watch those monsoon storms roll in, just be aware that you're confronting something in nature that is deadlier. So be careful out there. Uh, the last fatal incident was in 2003. It involved a 63-year-old woman uh, who was bitten by a particularly venomous uh, rattler. Of 
Fortunately, she was too far away from medical care to receive a, a timely care. For those of you who live in Scottsdale, the fire department uh, reported 255 snake and reptile removal calls between January and April of 2016. 403 snake and reptile removal calls between January and April of 2017. The numbers are going up because we're doing more in the desert. Banner Health treats 55 to 70 patients per year with rattlesnake bites. If you encounter a rattlesnake, what should you do? Try to remain calm. How will I know it's a rattlesnake? If you've never heard one, you will know instantly when you hear it. There is nothing like a rattlesnake's rattle that you've ever heard. Back away slowly. Don't run. Why not run? Well, if you're really uncoordinated like me and you begin to run, you may stumble. And if you stumble, there's no guarantee which way you're going to fall. And the last thing you want to do is fall onto or within striking distance of a rattlesnake. So never run away from a rattlesnake. Walk away slowly. Maneuver around the snake, ensuring a six foot minimum. How tough can this be? We're living with a pandemic. We all know what six feet are, right? So maintain that interval from the snake. If you're at home or in the neighborhood, contact your local fire department or the Phoenix Herpetological Society. There's the number. You can find it online if you need it. There's a $75 removal fee. Wait a minute, I can hear what you're thinking. I have to pay $75 to have somebody come and remove a rattlesnake from my property? Well, not necessarily. You can go all bubba and you can do it yourself. But before you do it, think about this. A single vial of crow fab anti-venom costs $3,000. And it's not unusual to require 10 or 12 vials in order to properly treat a rattlesnake bite. Needless to say, you and your insurance provider will get to know each other very well if you try to handle a rattlesnake and get it. Now, the treatment may save your life, but not necessarily your limb. And here's an advanced announcement. I am going to show you some images of what happens when people are bitten by rattlesnakes or fool around with rattlesnakes and are bitten. This is rather graphic material. Uh, I'm going to count to three and show it to you. So if you uh, want to avoid the, the images, just close your eyes and put your head down. I'll let you know when the image goes away. Here we go. Three, two, one. Okay, you can open your eyes. Uh, that generally convinces people not to mess with rattlesnakes. Now, uh, scorpions. Most of us have encountered them uh, in our homes, uh, and so we're pretty familiar with them. They pose very little threat to those of us who are adults, unless we are in extremely poor health. This thing is painful. Um, but not fatal to adults. Uh, we have the bark scorpion. In the interest of time, we're not going to dig into this uh, other than to let you know that it's venomous. Um, there were 588 calls between January and March of this year on scorpion bites. Did they happen? Uh, the peak season, aren't we lucky, is August. How deadly is a bark scorpion? Less than 1% of the stings are lethal to adults. Uh, there's only been one death reported in the United States since 1964. But this is something you should pay attention to if you have grandchildren or children who are very young in your house and you also have bark scorpion in your home occasionally or on the property. And that is 25% of children under five years of age who are stung die without being treated. So 
if you have visitors, winter visitors who come to visit you and have little children or you have uh, your own family visiting you, if you have scorpions in your house, have a big picture, show it to the little kids and say, you know, if, if you see this, you know, have, you know, tell Bubba, you know, tell your dad, tell your mom, all right, because you don't want to touch this. Uh, if you encounter a scorpion, simple solution, smash it. Don't do it while you're wearing sandals. The only thing you should put on a sting is a cold compress. Uh, the next thing that we're going to discuss uh, is very serious uh, for me because uh, heat and age are killers in the desert. Uh, and so I'd like you to pay particular attention. We're going to breeze through lightning because um, if you don't know that lightning is dangerous, you're beyond help. Um, so lots of lightning strikes in the United States, lots of lightning strikes in Arizona, 33 deaths per year in the United States. There have been 14 deaths in Arizona since 2009, all during the monsoon season. Remember that? The most frequent venue Hmm. Fishing. So if you don't fish, you're probably okay. Uh, we are going to page through some of the incidents so that we can get to uh, some of the things that may be more important. And this is this is one for every one of us who's over the age of 55. Heat. Please pay attention. Heat killed 197 people in Maricopa County in 2019. We're not talking about people from Mexico coming across the border. We're talking about people living in Maricopa, Maricopa County. 83% of those deaths occurred in July, August, and September. Heat discriminates. It likes you if you're 55 or older. It really wants you. So you've got to be aware if you're over 55 years of age that heat is not necessarily your friend. Your joints might like it, but your heart and your brain may not under certain circumstances. So there's heat exhaustion. Most of us have had this. Most of us have experienced this where you get weak and weary. You've been out maybe working in the yard or you've been on a long walk or a hike or uh, you've been in the heat too long. Uh, you tend to be a little pale and you get that cold, clammy kind of damp skin uh, and you're perspiring, usually cold sweat. You're actually okay as long as you understand what's happening to you and treat it immediately. And the treatment is very simple. Just sit down or lie down in the shade, get out of the sun, Loosen your clothing or loosen the clothing of the person who is suffering from heat exhaustion. Apply cool water to their body, back of the neck, around the neck. Give them an electrolyte beverage, Gatorade, whatever. Anything with a little sugar in it is good. And they'll be okay. However, uh, situations can approach heat stroke. This is serious. Uh, in Vietnam, we lost a number of Marines to heat stroke before the United States Marine Corps figured out how to deal with this. Heat stroke symptoms, very high, very high temperature, very high temperature. Person is flushed, red in the face, dry skin. The sweating has stopped. The body is shutting down and saying, I'm not going to release any more water. I'm not going to release any more liquid to cool the body because I'm in a panic here. My survival system is being overloaded. And so the person is flushed, high temperature, dry skin, little or no sweating. The treatment has to be immediate. I mean, like within seconds. Sure that many of you here have made an omelet or baked a fish or baked a cake. 
you take stuff out of the oven or off the stove, is it done cooking? No. With heat stroke, that's exactly what's happening to a person's brain. That brain is cooking. And even if they are saved, they may suffer permanent brain damage. So if you have somebody who hits the ground and they're passed out or they're starting to get really wobbly and you see that flush, dry skin, no sweating, you call 911 immediately. There's no debate about whether you need medical personnel because maybe you can help this person get out of this. You dial 911 immediately. You get them prostrate in the shade anywhere you can. If you're not anywhere near shade and if you've got people you can grab, have them stand over the person to create shade. You want to loosen their clothing and you want to apply cool water to the body, to the temples, to the carotid arteries, to the armpits, to the groin, anywhere you can get to major blood vessels to cool the blood because you want to drop the temperature of the blood that's going to the brain and to the heart. And small sips of water if they're conscious uh, because they're likely to be in shock. So you don't, you don't want to give them a lot of liquid. Just give them uh, some small sips of water. Uh, but mainly, first thing you want to do is dial 911. No fire department undertakes more mountain rescues than the Phoenix Fire Department. And I'm telling you this because this really is serious. We have three to four deaths a year on Piestawa Peak due to heat and age, and one death per year on Camelback due to heat and age. And that doesn't include people that we find who fall off rocks and nobody can quite figure out the cause. And some number of these, that we think the cause is, is heat. paper article, we won't belabor it in the interest of time, uh, but this was at 145th Way in Via Linda in the preserve in Scottsdale. And look at this, a 65-year-old person who was out hiking uh, and died from a medical-related event, which is a heat-related event. A dog. This would be funny if it wasn't tragic. It's the Lost Dog Trail, and people go out at noon in July with a dog for a hike. And they call because they have a water emergency while their dog dies. So be careful out there in the heat. Water, I think this is all we need to know. Carry water when you're out in the desert. Never go into the desert without water. In fact, never go into your neighborhood without water. Uh, Rabbi, how are we doing for time? You're doing great. Everyone's... Uh, how much time do we have left? How, well, it's up to you. I mean, everyone's interested in it, so... Okay, let's go to uh, 25 after the hour. Is that okay with you? Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, here's a story about people who ignore the warning about carrying water. Uh, some of you may have seen the film Tombstone uh, and remember that this is a character by the name of Johnny Ringo. And what he's doing is he's challenging uh, Wyatt Earp's friend, Doc Holliday, to a shootout. And he says, all right, Lunger, let's do it. Well, what's a Lunger? Some of you may know uh, we had a tuberculosis epidemic. Uh, that was a problem for uh, several decades in this country at the turn of the century. This is a hospital in Arizona reserved for tuberculosis. Uh, schools uh, did a great deal of education on tuberculosis, how to identify it, how to deal with it, how to avoid it. Uh, and if you live anywhere near Fountain Hills, the River of Time Museum has this chimney that they moved onto their property. And this chimney was part of a cabin that actually was constructed by a longer who came to Arizona probably in the 1930s uh, to live in the McDowell Mountains because of uh, the salutary climate. But our story goes back a little further. 
It goes back to 1897 when J.A. Moore finished his noon dinner at the Cave Creek Station in what is now the town of Cave Creek. There was a stage station there. And he readied his freight wagon for a trip to Phoenix for supplies. Now remember, no freeways, okay, just desert trails. He planned to travel across Paradise Valley, which is actually, if you live in Scottsdale, where you live. Uh, the town of Paradise Valley stole the name, but the valley that extends from Paradise Valley through Scottsdale and up north to Cave Creek is actually Paradise Valley. Uh, and he was planning to arrive uh, and camp at the Arizona Canal before dark and depart for Phoenix early the next day. It was a trip. When suddenly he noticed that there were tracks in the desert that seemed to be wandering aimlessly across the desert. In other words, they weren't straight. They just were sort of going back and forth, sometimes in what appeared to be circles. It just didn't look right. And they appeared to be from a buggy pulled by a single horse. Well, Moore was a typical old Westerner. If he thought something was wrong or somebody was in trouble, he began to follow the tracks to see if, if he could help. So we went through rocky washes and across rocky slopes. And after about 10 miles near sunset, he discovers a buggy, as he suspected. It contains an elderly couple, unconscious. They are Mr. and Mrs. Garrett Anderson from New York, and they've come to Arizona to visit their tubercular son who is living in Cave Creek for his health. They had left Phoenix the day before and stayed overnight at a ranch called the Taylor Ranch on the Arizona Canal. And the next morning they departed the ranch with a single canteen of water, despite the fact that the folks at the ranch said, take more water. They didn't do it. There's a map that shows you the uh, distance between Cave Creek and Phoenix. And it's from roughly that era. And you can see that there's not much in Cave Creek and Phoenix, two small communities, uh, lots of unmarked trails. Well, what happened was Moore attempts to revive them and only the wife responds. He loads them into his wagon, ties his horse to the back, their horse to the back and heads for the Taylor Ranch. And once he gets there, the Taylors send a rider to Phoenix to fetch a doctor who arrives early the next morning. Mrs. Anderson survives. But unfortunately, her husband does not. As the Phoenix Gazette wrote, uh, the scorching and barren desert of Arizona has claimed another victim. So please, when you're out in the desert, let's take some water. Uh, we are going to uh, pass over these folks cold. How many of you come from back east? Do we really need to talk about this? Yeah, I don't think so. Um, Dress for cold weather, layered clothing, wool, good boots, cap, knit cover, gloves, solid poncho or rain gear, watch the weather, pack high energy food, make sure you got a working cell phone fully charged, and three ways to make fire if you're in the desert. Um, we're going to skip uh, the first Corinthians and go directly to why death stains. Pay attention to this, Africanized bees. Uh, we're going to do more segments and that's it. Most bees in Arizona are, are benign, but they will sting if they're threatened, but will desist once the threat is removed. You've probably encountered this. Sometimes you get a bee that will kind of buzz your face uh, and they're, they're typically harmless. They're just giving you a warning or checking you out. The vast majority, if not all gregarious bees in Arizona are Africanized to some degree. Surprising. Uh, but the heavily Africanized bees, the AHBs, are aggressive bees that were imported from Africa to Brazil to produce better tropical honey. Thank you, Brazil. Um, AHBs, okay, Africanized bees, behave differently from other bees. They will sting if threatened, but will not desist once the threat is removed. They will follow the origin of the threat and continue to sting for up to a quarter of a mile. Okay, quarter of a mile. 
focus in particular for them is on your face and head because they're drawn to your exhaled CO2, carbon dioxide. Um, we're not gonna go through this in detail, but be aware we lose more people than we should to Africanized bees in Arizona and they can strike anywhere, in an urban area, in a suburban area, in the desert. Arizona Game and Fish's official policy for their staff is if the staff is working out in the field and the staff encounters bees, the staff is to discontinue whatever they're doing, return to their vehicles and leave the area. So be aware uh, if you are confronted by aggressive bees, you wanna be very careful. Uh, what do you do? Remain calm, good advice. Don't swat at the bees, you're just wasting energy. Uh, if the bees appear to be solitary and they're mostly focusing on their work, not you, uh, you got a few bumps or maybe you got a single sting. Get out of the area. Okay. However, if you're stung more than once and are confronted by several bees or hear a swarming sound, get out of the area quickly. This is one of those times when you definitely want to run. If you are stung repeatedly while you're leaving the area, increase your pace, cover your face and your head with any clothing, even if you have to pull your blouse or your shirt up over your head, you are much better off taking the stings to your torso than to your eyes, your nose, into your mouth. You wanna protect your head and face, shut off the access to the uh, carbon dioxide and get to some sort of safety. If you're fortunate, the attack will break off within about 100 yards, length of a football field. So you can make it that far, in most cases, the bees will give up. But it could go on for a quarter of a mile, just be aware. Well, if I'm in my yard, can I jump in the pool? No, you gotta get in the house. They know you're in the pool, they'll wait for you to surface. That's how aggressive they are. So be careful around bees. And now a few things we do to ourselves, we're gonna, we're gonna tell, we don't have to talk about this, right? We don't put our cars in washes, right? Not a good thing. We're going to uh, go directly to the end in the interest of time, because, ah, let's take a second for this. Have you ever heard about base jumping? That was news to me when I first learned about it years ago. Where does it get its name? People like to jump off buildings, antennas, structures, and earth. Here's how it's supposed to work. Here's this young lady out on this ledge. Would you do that? I wouldn't do that. But there she is. And what she's going to do is she's going to hurl her young body off into space. And at some point before she impacts, she's going to take the parachute on her back and she's going to trigger it. Doesn't always work that way. Here's an example of somebody who went into the superstitions, didn't have his chute on, was climbing along a rocky wall, fell. That was uh, the end of this particular person. So don't take up base jumping, please. Um, we are going to our last story. It is a sad story, but it's also a lesson in not messing with nature. Here's some stuff you can tell your grandchildren and children and friends and neighbors about saguaro cacti. How much water do you think a saguaro can retain? How about this? 80 pounds per linear foot. So if you have a saguaro on your property or somewhere around your condo, take a look at it, figure out approximately how tall it is. Multiply that by 80 pounds. That's how much water it can hold. And don't Oh, if you're Canadian, it's 120 kilograms per linear meter. Don't forget to include the arms in your calculation because they store water too. It gives you an idea of how much water a cactus can hold. Well, with apologies to Ernest Hemingway, our story is called The Farewell to Arms. In 1982, this is a true story. You can ask the Sheriff's Department. Two roommates, David Grunman and James Joseph Suhatsky, pack up their shotguns and head for the desert north of Highway 74, just west of Lake Pleasant. 
And Mr. Grunman decides to entertain himself by doing something called cactus plugging. It's not done so much uh, these days because people are more environmentally conscious. But this was a mode of entertainment where young men would go out into the desert with their shot. They would pick a cactus. In this case, Grunman picked a small cactus. They would shoot at it with their shotguns until it fell over. So he selected a relatively small saguaro as the target. And after a few minutes of blasting it, guess what? It toppled. Well, one good thing leads to another. And so Grunman exclaims, that was easy. And his next target, he selects a 26 foot tall saguaro. Now, if this strapping lad on the trail is about six feet tall, that saguaro is roughly 25, 26 feet tall. So he selected a saguaro like this. And he proceeded to blast away at the base. What he forgot was that the saguaro has arms. And the vibration from his vandalism of this cactus shook loose one of the arms, which fell on him and crushed him. He became immortalized by a rock band called the Texas Lounge Lizards in a song, Saguaro, that was popular uh, back uh, many, many years ago for a short period. The moral of the story is let's all leave nature alone. Uh, there are enough ways to die in the desert without self-inflicted wounds. And so be careful out there. The Sonoran Desert is a beautiful gift to each of us. We all enjoy it. Uh, we wouldn't be here if we didn't, even despite the heat. So enjoy the desert for a long time to come. But remember, when you go out into the desert, just like when you go to Albertsons, you are responsible for Thank you. Thank you so much. I love this. Um, I have someone asked a question in the chat about the Africanized honeybees. Will they truly desist after a quarter mile? Yes. Um, there's a, they understand in that little bee brain that there's a certain amount of distance that they shouldn't get away from their hive. Uh, and so they will break off. Uh, I know of no incident where, um, uh, anyone has been uh, stung beyond uh, a quarter of a mile. Uh, the, the, the primary issue is usually in the first hundred yards. Uh, if you can get into cover quickly, um, you'll be okay. Painfully uh, stung, but okay. Um, and that's why you have to move immediately. Um, don't fool around with bees in the desert. Don't fool around with bees in your backyard. Um, uh, th there's just too much risk. Uh, most of them are harmless, uh, but if you encounter aggressive bees, the best thing you can do is get in your home. If you're not at your home, get to your vehicle and get in your vehicle, or if there's another structure around, get into that structure. And if you can't do any of those, get as far away as you can, as quickly as you can. And is there any truth that a bee cannot sting multiple times? Yes. What happens is when uh, the stinger goes into your body, uh, what happens is the glands that inject the, uh, the, the venom or the poison that the bee has are ripped out of its body. So that bee's going to die. Uh, it will sting you once and that's, that's it, it's gone. All right, thank you. Anyone uh, have any questions for Leonard? This is, I love this presentation. I just wanted to say that I really loved it as well. <laughs> it was a real, and it was so interesting to see the um, mountain lion next to the bobcat because it is confusing and for you to point out the differences and that's now, you know, in, ingrained in my brain. Um, I did go to a talk by the urban wildlife specialist, Darian Julian, and he mentioned that some of the rattlesnakes have mutated and they don't have rattles anymore, which is another level of, of um, fear. 
Uh, that's true. Uh, all I can tell you is uh, I've never encountered one without rattles. Um, but yeah, there, there, there are snakes that uh, are venomous that don't have rattles, uh, but none in Arizona other than the, the Arizona coral snake, as far as I know. And actually, I was referring to, I think there's more kinds of African bees, aren't there? Or is it just one? Is it just one kind of African bee? I'm sorry? Um, is it just one kind of African bee, or are there several different kinds? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know the answer. Uh, what I do know is that uh, the Africanization of the bee population is so diverse that um, most uh, wildlife specialists cannot tell the difference between the bees unless they put them under a microscope. Oh, okay. So um, I was actually thinking of an incident I had in Narragansett, Rhode Island. I had what was I thought was called ground bees. They were in the ground. And um, I was pu putting some poison in or ammonia or whatever they told me to do. And one came out and it just kept going all around my face. And I kept swatting them. I'm not particularly afraid of bees. And, um, and he just kept at me, at me, at me. Unfortunately, I didn't have very stable shoes on at the time. And I started to back up and run. And um, I didn't get as far as a quarter of a mile. Sorry, hold on. There you go. Judy, I uh, muted you by mistake for the background noise. I was looking at you to see if you had done that on purpose. Yeah, no, no, I was trying to hit uh, for Jerry about, you know, Robinson, but I got yours by mistake. Okay. Yes. So, so at any rate, this guy finally stung me, but I had gone backwards on the street, you know, on the asphalt. I had, this is no lie. That's the size of the bruise I had on my, um, on my hip. <laughs> but it was just one sting. And um, that was it. But I wondered if, if, if that was an African bee, because I never heard of a bee keep coming at you like that. Oh, well, I do. <laughs> hard, to, hard to say. Uh, you know, I'm not a medical uh, professional. So. Well, thank you very much for the talk. Jerry, do you have a question? Yeah, well, first of all, very educational talk, really appreciate it. I live in Prescott, not far from Paulden. It was my understanding that that woman who got bitten by the snake, the rattlesnake, that was a Mojave rattler, which I think is the most deadly of all of them. And she was trying to kill it with a kitchen butcher knife. How stupid. So there you go. <laughs> Too stupid to get killed. <clears throat> Yeah, there's the story of uh, if you're bitten by a snake, if you can kill it and take it with you to the uh, the hospital or the medical facility, it helps them with the diagnosis. And uh, the answer is, yeah, it might, but it's not worth the effort. Right. Ethel, <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to ask? Are, are most rattlesnake bites on the legs or ankles? Because most people are walking. It's, that's why I thought cowboys wore boots. It helps protect them. That's part of it. Part of it too is they're working around horses. Oh. But are most of the bites really on the legs? I had a patient once who was bitten by a rattlesnake. She was on, on a walking path, never saw it, bit her on the ankle, and she was in rehab for over a year. Oh, yeah. Oh, it was terrible. The, 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 the tissue damage uh, can be... Uh, can, if, that's another reason why you don't put a tourniquet on a limb uh, when there's a bite, because what you're doing, if you put a tourniquet on, most people think, well, if we put a tourniquet on the leg or on the arm, we'll keep the poison from spreading the body. And the answer is, yeah, you will. You'll concentrate it in that arm or you'll concentrate it in that leg, and that will make the tissue damage worse. That makes sense. So where did so where did the sucking the venom come from? Like that people always think that. Where does it come from? Like where's that theory come from? 
Uh, well, I know that uh, some of the venom, anti-venom that we uh, we use here in Mexico comes from Mexico. Uh, uh, the uh, the Mexicans uh, have developed uh, some uh, some fairly powerful uh, anti-venom. But again, I'm not an anti-venom expert. Other no, than no, I was asking something else. I was saying, where is the theory to suck the venom out come from? You know how you, you said oh 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 cowboy movies. Where else? Right. You make, two, you make two cross cuts on the two fang marks and, and you, you suck the poison out and your saliva gets in the wound, which causes an infection for the person who's been bitten. And you draw some venom into your mouth. And if you've got a cut uh, or in your mouth or a sore, uh, you're going to aggravate that as well. So, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's cowboy movies. I remember seeing it in the Boy Scout manual growing up, but I think they revised the manual by now. I hope so. Yeah, I'm, sure they, I'm sure they have. Anyone else have any questions? Yes. What happens to like the pumas or the bobcats that are, are taken away? Are they relocated or euthanized? Good question. Um, most, of the, most of the time, uh, they will be taken somewhere else in the desert and released. Uh, however, if there's a suspicion, first of all, if they're rabid, they're going to be fine. Uh, but if they're not rabid, but they appear to be acclimated to human beings, generally speaking, what Arizona Game and Fish will do is take them to a rehab facility so that uh, the rehab facility can care for them, uh, maybe for the remainder of their lives, or can make arrangements with zoos around the, the country or in North America to take them uh, in, a, in a zoo environment. Uh, Arizona Game and Fish does not um, euthanize animals uh, casually. They'll, they'll try to do everything they can to rehab that animal or get it away from people uh, rather than kill it. Okay. Alan, you had a question? Yes, I had it in chat. But um, When I was in the Grand Canyon, there was a group of deer and, you know, I guess, what do you call the male deer? Got yeah. And I was taking a picture and one came right up to me. I swear it was like that far away. So I just froze. And in the meantime, the park guards were a few feet away, just watching the whole thing. Um, did I do right just by staying there, freezing? He, the animal eventually just walked away. <laughs> yeah, if, if it's approaching you, first of all, those deer are well acclimated to, to human presence. Mm -hmm. um, if it approached you but was not aggressive uh, and the park staff knew the deer and they do know uh, individual deer, oh. uh, they probably just shrug their shoulders. Uh, you weren't doing anything aggressive, which is the right right thing to do. Just be yourself, freeze. <laughs> so you, you did exactly the right thing. Now there are Animals, I would not do that with. I would not do that with an elk. Okay, I would not do that with an elk under any circumstances. I would not do that with a moose. I with heard that. With a bison. <laughs> but, yeah, the deer up at the Grand Canyon are all pretty much acclimated to humans. Okay, and if you see a coyote, Two things to, to, to know about coyotes. One is if they're acting aggressively, they may very well be rabid. So get to a phone, dial 911, and report it. Uh, because aggressive activity by coyotes is unusual. Uh, the second thing with coyotes is if you definitely want them to go away, they hate loud, loud noises. So if you scream or if you yell at them, go away, coyote, go away. Uh, they'll, they'll trundle off. Arizona Game and Fish actually uh, recommends if you, if you have a coyote issue where they frequently visit your property and you're concerned, take a Coke can or some sort of soda can, put a couple of rocks from your desert landscaping in it, and use it as a rattle. That, that sound will bother them uh, immensely and they will go away. 
guys. All right, any last questions? How about javelinas? Oh. Um, okay, two points. Number one, despite what you may have heard, javelina do not attack people. What happens is typically when we hear an attack story, it's, well, me and my dog were walking down the street and we'll say, stop right there. Your dog looks just like a coyote to a javelina. And if that javelina has young or that herd has young, they will attack the dog. And if you try to protect your dog, they will consider you to be part of that dog's pack. So they rarely attack people. Sometimes people are struck by javelina when they panic and hear a human because they have lousy eyesight. And so they'll charge in any direction. And if you happen to be in the way, you're going to be hit, but it's not an attack. They just don't know you're there and you're in the way. The second thing to note about javelina is please, 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 if you have friends and neighbors who think it's cute to feed javelina, so they <laughs> it's not a good idea. Okay. Uh, it's not a good idea for the safety of you, your neighborhood, uh, your grandchildren, your children. Because javelina, if they become accustomed to being fed, tend to decide that everybody that they see should feed them. And if they're not fed, they're going to get nasty. So if you, if, you, if you see people or know people who are feeding javelina, please advise them to desist. It's against the law. Oh, interesting. The law part. I'm sorry? It's, a, it's an interesting thing about the law part. Um, I'm sorry, my hearing is... No, no, I was saying it was inter it's interesting that there's a law against feeding them. Yes, there is. It is illegal. Uh, it, it, is a state, it is a state statute. Nice. All right, any other last questions? No. Marianne, did you have a question? All right. So thank you so much, Leonard. I, I, we so appreciate this. This was, this so, was I actually want to share right this with my relatives. Say, so this is what we get in Arizona. <laughs> yep. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Be well.